Hello and welcome back to the Sitcom Archive Deep Dive Overdrive. We are the Sad Old Podcast. We are taking a deep dive through every single episode of the 70s hit sitcom The Good Life. We're up to Series 4, Episode 3. And I'm your co-host, Alison Barton-Simmons. Hello, I'm Ex Benedict, the other fella. And we're up to our speaker today, I think it's called, this episode. Yeah, our speaker today, um, which is where basically Barbara gets a moonlighting job as a public speaker, isn't it? It is. I really enjoyed this episode, actually. Did you? I did, yeah. Oh, I was going to say later on um, that it was a little bit of a damp squib to me. Bit of a filler. Filler and no killer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we've already discussed that they stopped making the show after this series because they'd run out of ideas. Mm. And I just thought, you can see this in this one and the last one, actually. I still enjoy it because it's a good life. Yeah. But I just thought, yeah, yeah not, not that fussed. Oh, okay. But there you go. Oh. Clearly, there was something in it for you and it got an 8.2 on IMDb. So I'm in the minority. Winner, winner. Now, I was, um, I was watching some other old sitcoms this week just because that's what I do. That's what you do as well, isn't it? it Let's be honest. It is. And I, I was just ha- happened to be watching an episode of The Young Ones where they all entered the room playing each other's characters. Do you remember that scene? I do. I love that one. And it just got me thinking because we've already discussed about who, who could be modern version, modern actors who are playing um, the characters from A Good Life if, if they reprise the show, which would be a bad idea, in my opinion. Um, and it just made me think, I wonder how they'd have got on if they'd all been cast differently. So Richard Bryars was playing Jerry and oh, yeah. Felicity Kendall was playing Margot. Who do you think would have excelled playing the other male or female role in the show? Because they are, they are sort of very, very different, aren't they? The couples, I suppose they've, the way that they are portrayed is to be almost the opposites of, of the other neighbours. Hmm. I think Paul Eddington as Tom would have worked, I think, because I think he can sort of turn his hand to most things, can't he, to most characters. Yeah. I think also the I think also Richard Bryce would have, would have been fine as a sort of middle class snob. Yeah. I think it's the the female. I think the characters female characters, would, yeah, would have been a bit more tricky to. I, I don't know whether I don't, I don't know whether this is just like a bit of a sort of judgment thing based on how she plays Margot, but Penelope Keith as Barbara. I don't know if it would have been overplayed a little bit, perhaps. Well, she she's always been at pains to point out that she's not posh. She's just well spoken because of elocution, I suppose. Okay. But I've ne- having said that, I've never seen her in a role where she's sort of Slumming changed it. her voice. <laughs> yeah, sort of. Speaking more common tongue, shall yeah. we say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But then again, Barbara as a character, she's still got that received pronunciation edge to her, I suppose, hasn't she? Because she is, even despite the lifestyle that she now leads, she's still middle class, living near the capital. Yeah, yeah. And I guess probably standards of grammar were better anyway. Yeah. So they, they do, like Tom and Barbara say, when one does this, one finds... Exactly. It's not just Margot, is it? I mean, Margot does it with a, a sort of a little bit more of a superiority, shall we say, yes. in a general demeanour. Yeah. But yeah, I think they're, they're quite well spoken anyway, Tom and Barbara. Mm. But it reminds me of a quote from, I, I saw Richard, not Richard, um, David Mitchell interviewed years ago when he was asked about the role that he and Robert Webb, yeah. the characters that they played in Peep Show. Yeah. I think he was asked whether he ever fancied playing the, the part of Jeremy, instead yes. of um, the part of Mark in the show. And he his answer was sort of perfect because he said, well, you just can't imagine us playing it the other way around. It wouldn't have worked. No. And it's a bit like that with Margot and Barbara, isn't it, I think? I think it is. I think it is. If it had been sort of presented as that from the start, maybe we'd be having the opposite conversation that we couldn't see it working the other way around. But it's hard, isn't it, once you've got that in your mind and in your mind's mm. eye and you hear the voices and you see the the characters' movement and gestures, and it's hard to not think about them in that in that way. Yeah, their careers may have gone different ways. You could, you know, yeah. Bob um, Felicity Kendall could have ended up in the To the Man of Bone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Who knows? Bravo, Jerry. Right, I'm about to pull on my Les trousers um, to do <laughs> <laughs> a blankety blank. Ben, are you ready? Of well, no, I'm not, but I'll give it a go anyway. Have a try. 
Good life, blankety blank, blankety blank. Good life, blankety blank, blankety blank. Good life, blankety blank, blankety blank, blankety blank. Blankety blank. Okay, so I've got three blankety. What's the what's the generic? What what's, I've got three blankety blanks. Is that the the correct um, grouping of the collective noun? Yeah, for, what is for it? a blankety blank. Um, yes, I don't know. Blankety blanks will do. I've got three blankety blanks for you then. Okay. Okay. Number one: brandy, whiskey, port, sambuca, blank. Would you like that again? Brandy, whiskey, Zambuca, port, blank. Brandy, whiskey, port, Zambuca, blank. Yeah, go on, give me some context. Okay. It's season four, series four, episode one. This is spoken by Jerry. Right. Oh, I've just told you. Does that matter? <laughs> um, I think I'm going to guess Jerry. Shall, shall I tell you the word? <laughs> <laughs> You, you've not got your les trousers on at all, have I'm you? I'm not. I've just got one leg in. I've got one leg in and the other one's just flailing about. <laughs> um, it'll be something to do with when they go and stay in that place in Mayfair then, won't it? So it's, it's, It is. It's It's around the earlier part of the episode prior to, prior to Mayfair, Mayfair black satin sheets. Okay. Well, I'm just going to go with Peapod Burgundy then. It's a good guess, but it's not right, Ben. You sound like Roy Walker there. <laughs> oh, no, no, yeah. It's good, but it's not right. The answer's Terps. Terps. That does ring a bell now you've said it. I should have got that, you know. Right. Blankety blank two. Yep. What about my rights? I do have them, you know. It's just that they're not allowed to come out in this blank. Um... The obvious answer would be that Jerry says it about in, in this house because of the fact that Margot dominates everything. But I'm just having a little think to see if it's actually something else. Do you want a clue where I don't tell you the answer? Yeah, see if you can, yeah. <laughs> Without actually <laughs> revealing what the answer is. Um, it's a bit part character. Uh, I do have rights, you know. Okay, so it's like, yeah, that's it's from the Windbreak War. It is from the Windbreak War. And it's, I can't remember the character's name, though. Oh, my God, what was his name? Mr. It's not NB. It's not NB, because he she leaves him a note. Bailey, Mr. Bailey, isn't Mr. it? Mr. Bailey, well yeah. done. That's one uh, point. I do have rights, you know. What was the rest of the quote? Without the answer. I do, uh, <laughs> what about my rights? I do have them, you know. It's just that they're not allowed to come out in this blank. Not allowed to come out in this Environment. Close. Good. It's good, but it's not right. Oh. What's Mr. Chips doing there? <laughs> the answer is district. Ah. District. As in, as in the avenue. As in the avenue. Okay. No got one point, though. You've got yeah. one out of four so far. I'm off the board. You are. Right. Here's our final blankety blank. What leading lady could possibly do the best playing opposite a man with blank trousers? I know this one. I know I don't. <laughs> with, with blank trousers. I was about to say with a steel plate in his head because that was what was alluded <laughs> to the other week. Yes, with, it was. What leading lady could possibly do her best? Playing opposite a man with blank trousers. I'll give you a clue without telling okay. you the answer. Blank trousers. So Barbara says it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. Do you want a clue as to which episode it is? Go on then. I'm not very it's... good at this, am I? I need clues left, right and centre. I know, but they're not easy. Um, it's series two, episode five, Mutiny. I figured it'd be that one because that was the Sound of Music one, wasn't it? Yes, yep. Flatulent. It's good, but it's not right. Oh. The answer is squeaky trousers. Squeaky trousers. I couldn't remember if maybe the guy just had terrible wind. During no, the it was the, it was them. It was them. Um, the lederhosen that kept squeaking. Of course, it was bloody hell. This is the thing. This is why people come across as thick on quiz shows because if they're given enough time, they'll work it out. 
Absolutely. And but if you're you've under got, pressure, aren't you? If you've got the answers in front of you, it's really easy. Yeah. Unless you're me. My history teacher, one who wants to be a millionaire the other month, though. So it's very easy for I me to say, say that. Yes. Oh. Yeah. Good on him. Well done, Don. So, all right. Two out of four. Two out of six. That's pretty shitty. Ain't bad. Said Meatloaf. Yeah. Give me another one before we finish this run. <laughs> Said Meatloaf. <laughs> Right, I'm going to take my Les trousers off now and put my proper clothes back on. Okay. Should we get stuck into this episode then? Let's do that. Good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. So our speaker today, um, which is Series 4, Episode 3, um, starts us off in Tom and Barbara's kitchen uh, amongst a big, a big pile of chicks on the table, mm. um, which were very cute. They were, yeah. Very cute chicks. I love, I love chicks. Love chicks. They were nice. They were nice chicks. I'm not so bit not so much of a fan of fully grown chickens or hens. No, I'm not. But chicks, little squeaky chicks that, that are all fluffy. Yeah. And Barbara was she's busy trying to count them and really struggling because obviously chicks move around. But this is leading us towards Tom's new project. Tom is in the middle of building chicken villas, and mm. he's he's built like. A little model of this little hen house that he's that he's going to build. It's very like impressive, a, wasn't it? Conceptualized it into a little. That that's the type of thing that you can make a lot of money doing these days, isn't it? Little models of projects. Models of real projects, yeah. And I suppose this is where his skills as a as a draftsman are paying off because he's able to use those mm. and utilize those skills in his in his new life. Instead of making little little rhinoceroses or elephants or whatever it was <laughs> that he was yeah. doing previously. Making hen houses out of um, cardboard. But it was, yeah, it was very impressive. Margot comes flustering in and reveals that she's been let down by Mrs. Wormwood at the library. She was going to do a speech to the Tones Women's Guild, which Margot is a part of. And now Margot is, is frantically trying to find somebody that can come and speak to this group of ladies about anything that's, that's going on. And she says that she's been reduced to scraping the barrel, but can Barbara do it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tactless as usual, isn't it? Absolutely. But Barbara's very sort of concerned that she's not going to have much to talk about, even though she's got this radical new new life. She's on a day-to-day basis being self-sufficient which is a, it's a constant thing, isn't it? Even though they are at home, life is constantly about work for them. So she's going to have loads to tell people about. Mm. And so Barbara sort of reluctantly agrees to, to get involved. Yeah, she wasn't keen, but she, she, she basically said it means a lot to you, Margot, doesn't it? Because Margot was developing a crisis headache. I, I love that, a crisis headache. I'm going to try and drop that into, into something in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. That I've got a crisis <laughs> headache. I love it. Yes, I think I've had a few of them in my time as well. Yeah, because there's some disbelief expressed that Margot would even invite one of the goods to do this because doesn't our way of life embarrass you? That's when Margot mm. points out that actually it's really not so bad when Barbara expresses it in a less silly way, perhaps. And yes. Not, and I think she focuses on the, the more wholesome aspects. So she's kind of like, she's not really cajoled. Margot's tactless comes in with a big sort of um, wig hat on. <laughs> oh, yes! I don't know what yes. that's all about, but it's a hat that looks like it's just made of a wig. And she just looks like she's geared up for this thing. So, Mark, so I think Barbara just feels sorry for her, doesn't she? And she says, okay. I'm laughing because <laughs> my note about Fashion Corner here says, fur jacket and hat, which looks like hair. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, you're on the same page then, eh? <laughs> Margot says that um, she, she can give She'll give Barbara 20 minutes to chat about self-sufficiency, but this must not include animal digestive habits or procreative systems. Mm. So this is like a prerequisite to not, don't show me up, is pretty much what she's saying. More or less, yeah. I think so. And also, no trousers allowed. No trousers. Absolutely. Good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life, good life. So Margot... After the event, is now on the telephone to a Mrs. Burke who is congratulating Barbara via Margot on the talk, and Margot's tr- trying her best to sort of place the emphasis on her organisational skills. Yeah, she's not getting the credit for what, it, is she? She's not, and this is what she wanted. She needs this pat on the head, really, doesn't she? Validation. She, she likes really. to know that she. Yeah, she likes to know she's done a good job. We then get Lady Truscott, who is 
played by Angela Thorne. What else has she been in, Ben? She was probably majorly known, no pun intended, majorly known as Marjorie. <laughs> Major Marjorie. Major Marjorie. For Mar- Marjorie Frobisher from To the Manor Born, which was Audrey Forbes, Hamilton's best friend. Yeah. So her and her and Penelope Keith carried on their relationship, professional relationship. They didn't yeah. have their Les trousers on. <laughs> and as well as that, she was also in Three Up, Two Down, which is another sitcom. And more recently, I don't know if you've ever seen Brian, The, the Life of Brian Pern. No, I've not. Um, I don't think I've even heard of that. It's quite good. It's about a uh, faded rock star, really. Um, who's in it? All right. Who's in it? Who's in it? Him from The Fast Show. The guy who plays Tommy Cockles. Simon Day. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so she's very. she was instantly recognisable. She's someone that I've seen sort of in loads of TV shows. So when she, when she appeared, I was like, oh, it's her. Brilliant. So following on from the conversation with Mrs Burke... Margot gets a call from Lady Truscott, who was at the, the, the talk that, that Barbara did, mm-hmm. and is asking if she can sort of book Barbara for more um, speaking events, which is brilliant. Barbara obviously just did a really good job. And I think when she's on the phone as well, Margot's Lady Truscott voice is fantastic, isn't it? The telephone voice is like beyond the stars, isn't it? Yeah. Margot Ledbetter. Lady Truscott. <laughs> oh, good morning, Lady Truscott. Oh, very well, thank you. And you? Oh, good. <laughs> I'm so pleased, Lady Truscott. One arranges these little meetings to the best of one's ability, but when one speaker stands up, one is in the lap of the gods. <laughs> it's the most telephone of telephone voices. She keeps repeating and her when name she comes as well. Off, she keeps saying, oh, Lady Truscott, Lady does, Truscott, yeah. Lady Truscott. <laughs> when she comes off, Jerry says, Who was that? Mrs. James Patterson. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. So Margot is fixing up um a tea around at her house so that she can get Lady Truscott to come round and she she fires she's firing Jerry off to go and get a, a hamper from Fortnum's mm. which Jerry doesn't quite understand the, the, the reasoning behind this. I was just gonna say he's also been tasked with rounding up Mrs. Pearson. Yeah. From the bingo hall on a day off the poor old dear to do some cleaning. Bring her back, get her to clean the house because it's filthy. And Jerry does say to her, why, what are you going to be doing? Yeah. And she's very, very put out by being asked this. And she says, well, I'm not going to just be lounging about, Jerry. I'm going to go and tell Barbara what she needs to do. And then I'm going to have a lie down until I need to get ready. <laughs> Brilliant. The life of Margot. She's amazing. Don't! Not panicking. I'm awaiting instructions. We're then outside the, the 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 goods house, and Tom's busy bringing in wood from the rain. He's chucking it down. He's there bringing in wood that's that's laid at the back of the house. And Lady Truscott turns up mm. at their house. So immediately you, you're thinking here there's going to be some kind of comedic misunderstanding. But actually, Lady Truscott's ace, isn't she? She sort of just gets mucking in. She's carrying. Carrying wood into the house, she's brilliant. She seems really uh, game and fun, doesn't she? She does, she does. She loves the chicks. Yeah. She said that her father keeps chickens. She sits down with a peapod burgundy and asks Tom to call her George. So she's very, what we're, we're thinking like Lady Lady Truscott's sort of, you know, highfalutin, but I, I think she's quite, quite well, cool. Well, after the event, because it's, obviously this came from came out before To The Manor Born, but I was imagining yes. in it, her to be... More like uh, Audrey into the Man of Bone, but she turns yes. up and she's happily supping the peapod burgundy. Her reaction's no no patch on Mr. Coles, of course, but she has a bit no. of a fun. No ooh. one's going to be. No. The guy's <laughs> but she a did hero. A, ooh, yeah. She did a, ooh, 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 that's a bit much. Um, yeah, and then Barbara turns up, doesn't she? Lady Truscott tells Barbara that her talk was the most interesting thing that she's heard in years, and that's lovely. I think mm. for, for all the things that... Barbara sort of put to one side in in order to join her husband on this this journey to be told that you're interesting you know what you're talking about you're obviously engaged in what you're what you're doing and the direction that you're taking your life people want to hear about it people want to that they're actively interested and want to know more which is brilliant yeah she's getting the validation that Margot was seeking almost yeah yeah poor Margot <laughs> with, with a Fortnum's hamper Lady Truscott's asking Barbara if she will do more and more of these uh, these talks to different community groups, and she's got um, a deaf group set up. 
and she's making they're making arrangements of when she's going to pick her up. Margot and Jerry at this point burst in, and Margot just shouts, "Don't drink the wine!" <laughs> yeah, because she's she's almost like projecting that Lady Truscott's just not going to be comfortable in the company of of Tom and Barbara, and it's just not going to be her scene whatsoever. Which is and she's and she's wrong. She is quite wrong, isn't she? Yeah, and poor Margot can't adapt to that. She can't adapt to her expectations not being met and just talk to her like a human being. She hasn't got it within yeah, her. Yeah, she does. I do feel sorry um, for her. I do. Missy, um, Lady Truscott explains that she's already on her second glass and Margot says, I'm desperately sorry, Lady Truscott. But I really am desperately sorry. What for? This is my husband, Jeremy. <laughs> Oh, I think she sun- the- Sunday names him again, doesn't she? I think she does. She did later on. She called it, yeah, she did call him Jeremy. I don't like it when she calls him Jeremy. I, I, it makes me feel uncomfortable. When she said, Jeremy and I are very much take us as you find us folk. Brilliant. Jerry Jerry got the opportunity to, or well, Paul Eddington got, out the, got the opportunity to bust out that face he does, that kind of flabbergasted. Yeah. He does it so well, doesn't he? <laughs> Margot's obviously arranged the tea next door, thinking that Lady Truscott was just going to call in on them and stop for the afternoon with the Ledbetters supping tea. But it's um, it's not to be. So she'd gone to all this trouble. Well, Jerry had gone to all this trouble of driving mm. round and to the bingo hall and collecting Mrs Pearson. Jerry's really pissed off, isn't he? Margot's, yeah. Margot's left sat there at the goods table with her face tripping her and they all go off, Jerry, Barbara and Tom go off to eat all this food. And yeah. I just felt sorry for both the Ledbetters because Jerry's yeah. been running round and now he's got those leeches eating all his food. And Margot's just sat there like looking really sad. And I thought, oh. What a shame. Yeah, I know. I know it's pathetic really that they put so much importance or Margot put so much importance in this. But I, I, I still couldn't help feel sorry for her. Jerry says he, he explains it as he's been tearing about all afternoon like a demented flunky. And it must feel like that sometimes when he gets mm. fired off to go and do all these jobs. But... This is, this is, I find this quite interesting because I sometimes have a nosy on the Fortnum and Mason website. I don't know why I do it. It's like torturing myself because I can't afford anything on there, but I like to look at the hampers sometimes (laughs) just to see, just to see what the, oh, they they are, they're like dripping with wealth. (laughs) Yeah. Money. (laughs) They're just dripping with, with money in baskets. And so Jerry had got a 50 pound hamper from Fortnum's. So I looked at what fifty pound would get you in. Are we in 1977 now? About yeah, yeah, I think so. So apparently, just I, I only used a website to sort of to see what fifty pound would be today, and it's two hundred and eighty pounds. So I can't imagine spending two hundred eighty pounds on a hamper just for for someone to come round to my house. No, it would be. A massive amount of money. And so I looked at a hamper, a, a, a corresponding hamper that was worth £280. And this is what you'd get today. Oh, my mouth's going to water, isn't it? A top hat strainer. That's not for straining top hats. That's It's a top hat shaped tea strainer. Um, you'd get a wooden tea caddy of Darjeeling, um, Ceylon loose leaf tea, English mint infusion tea, a Queen Anne tin, which I'm guessing is another tea. Yeah, get to the food, get to the food. <laughs> Piccadilly biscuits. Oh, now you're talking. Um, fruit cake, preserves, both raspberry and plum, a mug, some chocolate caramels and the actual Fortnum and Mason hamper, oh. which is part of the thing, getting it's part of the excitement to get a hamper. No cheese. No cheese, even for £280, no cheese. It's Jesus. just tea, biscuits. So it, so it literally is just a tea and biscuit hamper. Bloody hell. I know. A lot of money that intent. It is, yeah. Especially with all those teas and no cheese. I know. I wouldn't be happy with that. But you get to keep the mug and the, t- and the top hat strainer. I think I would cause a scene and Margot would would let- just- Margo wouldn't <laughs> let me go back again. <laughs> just throwing everything off the table. What the fuck's this? So Barbara's next talk that she's been um, asked to go and do is at a children's home, uh, but she's been she's a bit concerned now that she's leaving Tom for the third weekday this week to go off and do these 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 speeches. Yeah, she's been roped into the circuit, hasn't she, by um, George? Yes, she, who's very um, encouraging, very encouraging, and, and she's got an awareness that she's sort of putting on Barbara a little bit, but she's so enthusiastic about 
what Barbara's doing and getting other people to hear hear the same thing. Mm. Um, so they've they've been they've been to the children's home. They've come back to the to the goods house, and the cockerel in the meantime has escaped. Lenin the cockerel has escaped from the goods back garden. Tom's chased it all the way down the street, and the cockerel's got on the bus. Yeah. He's caught the number 71 to Kingston, hasn't he? And Tom's chasing behind. Um, so when, when Barbara and, and Lady Truscott get back, the chickens are everywhere. They're trying to busy, they're busy trying to get them back in the pens. And Lady Truscott trips and, and she rips a skirt, so ends up in a pair of Tom's trousers. Yeah. And I think the interesting thing about this whole setup is that, well, to me, Tom was faced with almost like a, so- a Sophie's Choice, wasn't he? When, it, when he's trying to put this greenhouse up and he can't do it and there's all that lovely, yeah. lovely clarinet music, well, woodwind of some description because yeah. there's, there's no dialogue. Once yeah. Lenin escapes, he basically abandons all the other animals. To go and get the cockerel. Yeah, to chase Lenin up the road and onto the number 71 bus. And he's just thought, he, he, he clearly he's got a favourite, hasn't he? Lenin. Now you can imagine Barbara would have been the same with Geraldine if something had happened to Geraldine. Yeah. The rest of the animals can go fuck themselves. Yeah. And I thought... Got a cockerel on the bus. Yeah, he, Tom's clearly got a, a strong affinity with this with this cockerel, hasn't he? He sits in like... When the, when he's sat on the bus, he's like nursing it as well, isn't he? Sort yeah. of like stroking it like you would with um, like a like a small fluffy pet. Yeah. Not, not a cockerel. Shows the softer side of him, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if he had to pay on the bus for the cockerel. Do you have to... Did he have to get a ticket? Well, he didn't have any money to get the bus back, did he? He had to have a long walk, him and Lennon. Poor Tom. Barbara agrees to do the last engagement on uh, Lady Truscott's list. As as she realises that she's been bullying Barbara into doing all these things, and she realises that Barbara's not got any spare time because life is just working for, for Barbara. Margot turns up at the Goods house um, and sees Lady Truscott in Tom's slacks, um, and she's very embarrassed on on her behalf. But then the weird thing is Tom thinks it would be fun to pretend he sexually assaulted her. Yeah, God, <laughs> just let's not joke about that, Tom. I just couldn't help yeah. myself. It's like, all right, all right, Tom. Hashtag yeah. different times. Wind your neck in, Tom, and everything else. The final job for Barbara is a visit to Grant House, which we find is a, is a remand centre for, for young men. Hmm. So there's lots of chitter chatter about this and about whether Barbara's going to be safe. Should she be doing it? Jerry says, I wouldn't let my wife set a foot in there. <laughs> I'll tell you one thing, Tom. I wouldn't let my wife set foot in there. Thank you, Jerry. Not that I'd let you let me anyway. <laughs> she wouldn't want to do it. But Lady Truscott and Barbara think that they might get something out of it because it's something that's useful. It's it's, it's like a structured life. It's, it's information, things that... that are something to think about once they are no longer in the remand centre. So they, 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 them two see the benefit of, of, of doing this. Yeah, and Tom, I mean, Tom doesn't try and stop her, but he's clearly a bit worried. So he says he'll tag mm. along. Yeah. 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 So at Grant House, it's, it's very chaotic. There's boys running all over the place, shouting and wolf whistling at Barbara. I can imagine it would be quite intimidating turning up as a, as a sort of young to middle-aged lady being wolf whistled at. Although she doesn't seem remotely... She doesn't seem that false, does she? No. Good on her. She's um, uh, more power to her. She doesn't... Ev- absolutely. E- even even after the the final gag comes, which we'll come to, she doesn't. she's not bothered. She's not. There's no rise out of her whatsoever. No. Um, Tom's brought a lead pipe, though. What's that to do? What, what's he going to do with that? Batter them all? I think he's playing a virtual game of Cluedo. Oh, dear me. Do you remember, do you remember Cluedo on ITV that had... Um, Richard Maidley presenting it. Was it was it like a quiz a quiz show version of it? Where yeah. not a quiz show, but uh, it was a game show version. It was a game show version, but it was it was acted out by a bunch of thesps. Like Tom yes. Baker played Reverend Green, I think. Was um Thingy in it? Um the guy from who was Pike from Dad's Army. Oh he might have been. I know Jerry Hall played Miss Scarlet. Ian Lavender. I think he was yeah. um Colonel Mustard. Leslie Grantham. Was Colonel Mustard, wasn't he? Oh right, okay. Maybe I'm thinking of a different one. No, then. I think Maybe I think they... they probably changed actors in between series oh, of that right. thing. But it was always really, really hammy and really funny. And I'll tweet out a link of, you know, the, you know what Tom Baker was like. 
Yeah. Well, there's a there's a, a master cut of Tom Baker overacting silently. So at the, <laughs> at the end of it, at the end of it, it was like Richard Madeley would say, "So could it be Miss Scarlet?" And the light would go on Miss Scarlet's face, like Jerry Hall. Yes, I, I, that, I've got a vivid memory of this. And when it was like, "Could it be Colonel Mustard?" Or, I think it was no Reverend Green. And it'd go onto Tom Baker's face, and he'd just be p- pulling the most <laughs> ludicrous faces because he was bored and he wanted to ham it up. He's so hammy, isn't he? That is brilliant. I'll tweet that out. Yes, please. Bravo, Jerry. Don't panic, Margot. I'm not panicking. I'm awaiting instruction. So after the after the talk, the boys all file out, and they've been riveted. They've been absolutely fascinated. We think in what Barbara's had to say. So it's all. It seems like a a, a winning. A winning afternoon, really. They assumed that the subject must have been interested, interesting to um, the the young guys. Tom stops one of them, who turns out to be Robert Lindsay. Yeah, a very cocksure, very cocksure. Yeah. Um, sort of doing that, like chewing gum, sauntering yeah. around yeah. Robert Lindsay. Yeah. A very young and handsome Robert Lindsay. Yeah. And he says, "Can I have a word with you, son?" <laughs> and he says, "You listen to the talk." There must have been something that that interested you. Why did you sit and listen? And Robert Lindsay says, "Well, we didn't want to didn't want her to get edgy and start moving about, which was quite an odd thing to say." But then we realise that she was stood in front of the window, Barbara, and the light was shining through, and they could see through her dress. Yep. Nothing. Nothing to do with self self sustainability. It was to do with looking at looking at her fine figure. Yes, underneath indeed. Her dress, and of course. Tom is outraged and trying to usher out there. And Barbara couldn't give a shit, like I said before. She's just, like, smiling to herself. Yeah. You know, she's got... She's a confident woman. I mean... She is. Her her pokies are always poking out anyway, aren't they? And, in fact, they were earlier on in this episode. The tit-tab was going up. She's she's quite happy to be ogled, I think, isn't she? She's confident in herself, so good for her. Yeah. And that's it, isn't it? That's the end of this one, It is. That's that's it. Bum-bum. That's the... Literally. (laughs) Yeah. Robert Lindsay disappears for... Tommy Tank and <laughs> yeah. What? Who was your most valuable player in this episode? Probably Barbara, because of the yeah. reasons I've already said that she basically um, powered through when she was anxious about doing it, and then mm. she did all these things for a good cause, and she just had loads of confidence and and had no shame, and you know she was just living her life and being successful at doing it. So I thought, oh, more power to you, Barbara. Because she doesn't get a lot I of agree. MVPs, does she? No, I agree, and it's all for the same reasons. I just liked the fact that she was the centre of 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 like the fountain of knowledge in this episode. It wasn't all about Tom and what he wants and how he does it. It's going to Barbara, who's experiencing it alongside him, but is is able to sort of pass that knowledge on to other people mm. and be interesting and interested with it. So. Definitely Barbara for this episode. I think some credit, and this is unlike me, but some credit to Tom because he wasn't jealous of Barbara. He was just supportive. And he was like, no, you go on and I'll do everything myself. And so... Yeah. uh, It was... Often his ego is bruised if he's not the centre of attention. But Mm. really, the anti-MVP for this episode was poor Margot, who was just so shallow about everything. Yeah. Just all about the tea. But we're not docking points. No. She's still winning. No, she is. In addition to Margot's hair hat <laughs> at the beginning of this episode, was there anything else that you think is worth flagging in Fashion Corner? Fashion Corner, Fashion Corner. Fashion Corner, Fashion Corner. I've got a few things that I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to um, with regards to this episode in Fashion Corner. Uh, Jerry's red cardigan was out again. I saw that, false. yeah. It's a stable um, now, isn't it? It is. It, it, I think it's taken over from the from the tan leather jacket. It must be at the dry cleaners, that, because we've seen quite a bit of this red cardigan. I'm seeing a, a, an emergence in roll neck sweaters underneath clothes at the moment in, from, for most of the um, characters. This must be, I don't know whether it was a late 70s thing. I remember as a kid having, having roll neck sweaters that were really itchy. But it, it must be a, a thing that's sort of coming into its own around this time. Margot, when she's taking the call from Mrs. Burke, congratulating the, the event, the, the, the speech that Barbara did initially, 
she's in like a powder pink sleeve sweater with I think it's like a tabard over the top like a cleaning tabard however it looks more like a dress it's like a chevron it's got like a moss green chevron detail on the front and it's got a matching um, piping around the collar and the um, the arms and it's t- and it's tied at the waist. It, it took me a while, but I, I did think it was it was actually like a cleaning tabard. And she's got a headscarf on as well, which looks magnificent. When Margot and Jerry burst in and Lady Truscott's round at the Goods House, she's in this like tangerine dress. Is Margot with a with a white hat? Uh, and again, the emergence of the the big flower is there. Yes, yeah. matching handbag. Lady Truscott, I wanted to mention her fawn. She's she's she's, she's dressed in a lot of fawn in in that episode. She's got a fawn coat, fawn roll neck sweater again, very sort of neutral colours which match her hair. So she she seems to be like one colour, the whole the whole of her. Mm. Everything about her is is just one colour. Grant House, all the guys there are in like a uniform of flared jeans and woolen lumberjack coats that were quite big in, in the 70s. Mm. They, they, they kind of reminded me a little bit of uh, Tucker Jenkins at the start of Grange Hill. <laughs> right. That kind of, you know, big furry collared jacket. And they all had the same one. It must be like a delinquent uniform yeah. that everybody wore in show, the 70s. Basically to show everyone that you're a wrong one. You're a wrong gun. If you've got one of these coats, you're a wrong gun. But I quite like that. It's, it, I think it's quite a cool look, really. Barbara's brown dress from the previous episode, which I'd never seen before, which I said in the previous episode made her look quite young and girly and childlike. This was this is what she wore. This was the dress that she had on that the boys were peeping through when she stood in front of the window. It's not her posh frock, is it? But it's her... It's not the posh frock. It's like the, the it... step below, if she has something that's more formal. Yes. It's not a cleaning clothes. It's like a going out to dinner, going doing serious work dress that, that boys can peep through. Yes. She also had a massive hat earlier in the episode when she came in, when George and Tom were already there at the table. She came yeah. in wearing this sort of... I think she wore it in the episode where she was mistaken for a boy as well, this sort of urchin oh, yes. hat. Yes. And it suits she suits Hello, Sonny. She looks good in it. She does. She does. Um, so that brings us to the end of, of Fashion Corner for this week. Hells Bells. Next week we are on season four, episode four. Do you know what we're on next week then, Ben? It's the Weaver's Tale next week. Ooh. Um this is all centred around a wheel, a weaver's wheel. Okay. That, um, from memory, Margot is taken with when she sees it in a shop window. And mm. Tom manipulates her to buy it because he wants to weave and he's got no money of his own and he's a shit house. Right. That's, That's not the IMDb right. um, description. <laughs> I should go and see if I can edit them. You know the way you can edit Wikipedia entries? Yes. So if you'd like to um, get involved and tweet us or follow us on Twitter or Instagram, you can find us by looking up the handle at Sado Podcast. We post rare videos from The Good Life and other things that the, the main actors were in, as well as photos. And you can find the same stuff on our Facebook page, which you can find by searching Sado Podcast. We have our own website, Club where you can get more information about us, read the blog posts we've written about the show, or listen to episodes if you don't do podcast apps. There's also a newsletter you can um, sign up for on the website. Subscribe if you want to be kept updated on what we're up to. And you can also drop us an email at sadopodcast.gmail.com and tell us what we missed. Finally, if you would like to leave us a nice review on iTunes or wherever you do get your podcast, that would be lovely. Um, I say this every now and again. We seem to be going up in the listens, which we're really grateful for, but it will really help us if you can leave us a nice review. Um, if you don't like us, don't leave a negative review. If you, le- if you leave us a nice review, then you will have our eternal gratitude. But if you leave us a negative review, then may all your bowel movements be loose and ill-formed. <laughs> don't know where I'm going with that. So shall we wrap this up? Um, join us next week for the Series 4, Episode 4, The Weaver's Tale. We shall see you then. I'll see thee. Now, Lady Truscott is ringing to ask 
Marjorie. No, Marjorie! Hang on, let me say that again. Bloody Marjorie. <laughs> hmm.